Raiders, welcome back to Sands Bikes, where you know we only talk e-bikes, and today on eTalk, we have the legend downhiller Andrew Nettling, or better known as Needles in the mountain bike industry, and we talk about his brand new Scott Lumen, which is the super light from Scott using the TQ motor, super interesting, we do a mini review of that, we also talk about his amazing long downhill career, what he's doing now, what he's riding, how he sees e-bikes being put into the future of mountain biking, and loads more. And before we crack on with eTalk, a massive shout out to Schwalbe, the long-term sponsor at Sands Bikes. I absolutely love my Schwalbe tires. I always use an ultra soft on the front, especially now as we're coming into summer and the trails are getting very dry in Spain. I absolutely love it. Riders, if you haven't tried an ultra soft, definitely give it a go and let me know how you get on. And now on to the podcast with needles and riders. Also, I wanted to let you know there are timestamps or chapters. And if you want to jump forward to a few different sections, you can do so. Anyway, sit back and enjoy this podcast with needles. Needles, mate, thank you so much for your time and welcome to eTalk. It's a pleasure to have you. Mate, thanks for having me. It's so nice to rush home from an appointment, hop on a podcast where I didn't have to prepare as much as much as you did. So uh, I'm oh, honored. Yeah. We oh, go. he's got notes as well. And highlights and highlights. And, and print it out. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I do the notes as well. And, and then, uh, like you said, then we're going to freestyle it as well. But uh, I'm excited because, uh, yeah, I'm going to get to know you, your channel, and uh, we're going to talk e-bikes, which I've never been against. I know uh, they've got interesting stigma and it's changing and evolving, but I've always been for it. I know. I know. I've, I listen to your podcast and that is my first point. I know I'm supposed to be interviewing you, but you asked me a question when we first started chatting on WhatsApp a couple of months, oh no, on Instagram a couple of weeks ago. What do I like about your podcast and what what I thought makes it different? I'm going to say, put it out there, writers, you've got to stop what you're doing right now and go and follow or subscribe to Moving the Needle. I reckon it's the best podcast. And the reasons are, mate, you're an ex-pro. You know how to get like the blood out of the stone. You know, like a lot of these guys, like the Danny Hart interview you did, man, I've never seen heard Danny Hart talk. You know, like he and it was so interesting because as a rider, as a as an absolute geek of the sport, I love it. I'm a super fan. I put these riders on a pedestal and I look up to them and like they're like superheroes and gods. But also, you bring out that that human aspect of them, and that's what I love about your channel, about your podcast. Mate, I I appreciate it. It's awesome to chat about it, and you've probably got a lot of experience on the video side that I could tap into. But I'm always asking the guys that message you. I really appreciate. It. I try to reply to everyone. Yep. I don't always get there, or they slip into the request one, and then I find them. And I always like because getting props is one thing, right? But how do you grow? How do you learn? And you need feedback. Me from racing, I could get feedback. The clock doesn't lie or the bike's feeling a certain way. So you always want to improve. So for me, the podcast is also like what's authentic to me. And I guess my style is evolving yep. from that Danny Hart one, which was in the beginning. Luckily, I knew him to now, hopefully, when I don't know a rider so much, it's evolved. But I want the feedback. What do you want to hear more of? And what do you like? You know, what can we do better? So that's where I'm at with the podcast. Yeah, no, and I think from memory that Danny Hart was like the second or third podcast. Yeah, man. I, I mean, I was quite nervous and I had all those printed notes behind my computer so I could go to them. Now it's just yeah. a Word document and it's kind of don't look at it because I want it to be a natural flow. And I think the writers have such incredible backstories. Like you said, they're all human. They're all going yeah. to the same mental battles as any amateur racer or even person on the bike there's a lot of doubt um there's pressure there's anxiety there's there's all those emotions so for me i think like that i traveled with danny so i know him kind of like a brother yeah um, and we've been through up and downs where we didn't get on where we did get on uh, i know his family so for me i know who he is as a whole and 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 in a race situation on the media you're not going to get the full picture, are you? But two hours no. with Danny, you're probably going to get a good understanding of what makes him tick, which is, yeah. which is kind of what my goal there, yeah. No, I definitely really enjoyed it. And writers, 
in the show notes, there will be a link to Moving the Needle and to this podcast. Definitely check it out. Now, a lot of the writers that watch the channel, uh, I don't call them subscribers. They're, they're writers. We're all writers, whatever level. They're probably not that, uh, well, some of them don't know much about downhill. So can you give them the writers a brief history of your career? And also, writers, Andrew Needles has just, uh, at how old are you, 37, 38? 38 and 39 in August. Okay, so, so 38 and three quarters. <laughs> what you're going to be seeing right now is last week, he jumped dark fest. Were you the oldest rider to do the the big jump line? I, I I guess so, but the the honest truth is it's not the big line anymore because the one ten foot jump was built. Come on, mate. So, that is no, a big no, line. But I've got to preface it with there's now a hundred and ten foot jump in the line, and then there was the ninety which I did. It took me a few years. I just meant to said I wasn't going to do it. It wasn't worth the risk for. You know, I don't want to miss a day on the e-bike, so you yeah, don't want yeah. to be hurt too much. So now, technically, it's the small line, which just is crazy because 90 foot looks massive, but when the 110 is there. So, yeah, uh, I am the oldest. I think if Nico Vink doesn't come to that event anymore, I think he's a similar age, and he's been jumping that line for so long. But on the ground, the most hilarious thing I think I heard, well, there was a lot of funny stuff and impressive stuff. But I met some casual guys that got into biking through lockdown. So I'm sure some of your listeners and riders are like this. Most right? definitely. And um, I took, so they don't know downhill and we'll get to what downhill is in my background, uh, but they know mountain biking. And they said, the one guy, I took my helmet off. He saw a few of the gray hairs and they're quite a few now. <laughs> and he said, dude, look at that old. And then he used the, that beautiful Aussie word, the C word. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah we like that. which we can't use. Great word. Very descriptive. And he was like, look at that old guy. He's like us. So it's quite hilarious that I think I've got to embrace that that might be how to inspire people is you're maybe older than some of the youngsters, but you're still doing this thing that you know how to do. I mean, I've been doing it for who knows how long. First race at 13 and 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 now I'm 38. So I've definitely been riding and racing for a hell of a long time. So uh, that was funny from Dark Fest. Um, downhill, if they haven't watched downhill, you've got to watch downhill. To me, it's the F1 of mountain biking. It's the fastest you can go hurtling down a hill the speeds, the terrain, the jumps. Um, it's like downhill skiing, but in the summer, down the slopes, over rocks, roots. Uh, if you can get to a race that is like seeing a dark fest, when you see it, the top downhill is in the world, your Loic Brunis, Amory, Greg Menard, speaking of old guys, just hurtling down the terrain that I promise most riders wouldn't want to really ride down. Yeah, um, no, no, definitely. So yeah, my my brief history is just spent 14 years chasing the downhill racing dream all over the world from a young in South Africa, looking up to Greg Menar, to realizing I had some skill and talent and work and determination to go out there and pursue a dream and uh, did 14 great years until I was 32. Um, nice. Well, that from painting all over the world. Yeah, it was awesome. That segues into a question I have down here, and I have quite a few notes here for you. I want to talk to three points in your career. You know, like as a, a mountain bike freak and a fanboy, you know, I think a lot of us can resonate with this question because we never, I've never made it. I wanted to be a pro BMX, so that never happened. Um, when did you know that you made it as a pro, and how did it feel? Yeah, I've all, I sometimes ask that question in the podcast because I do like it because it's it's a super interesting time uh, in your racing career. Um, a few things come to mind. I think my first year over was 2003. Minimal support, but from Global Racing, uh, and that was a team backed by Martin Whiteley for the for the riders listening that have a big knowledge. He's done Honda, you know, he's he's been an agent to Greg Minot. Anyway. But I was so Aussie. Yeah, he's an Aussie. Yeah, and he's done a hell of a lot for the world of mountain biking. Yeah. And um, so, but I was still like self supported when I was in America 
that team couldn't be at all the races. We only did a few together. And um, I was in the deep end at the first race qualifying, whatever it was at a Norba, which was very close to under World Cup at the time. PD mm -hmm. would come over, Gracia. Anyway, I qualified, whatever it is, in the 20s. Uh, and you're lining up with Kurt Voorhees behind you, a person you look up to, and whoever was in front of me. So that was not that I'd made it, but I was like, wow, we're in the big leagues here. So that was yep. daunting. Yeah, yeah. But when I finally thought, I guess I made it or I could make something of it, was when I qualified fourth at a Norba in Vermont with, from what I could feel, wasn't my best run or I wasn't going crazy. Yeah. Uh, I managed to blow up in the final, crash over the bars, get a flat tire, you know, all the items of a rookie yeah. move. Yeah, um, yeah. So that was probably cementing me like, okay, this potential people have spoken about or that I was hoping for, it's there. Um, but I still had to prove myself. I was on these satellite teams making no money, grouting tiles um, for for spare cash. My dad, uh, my late dad was, you know, still helping with the entries. Like you don't really feel like you've made it, right? But, uh, you know, fast forward, two years or the second or third year I got two top tens no the third year I mean two top tens at a world cup and I won a Norba I mean that yeah. to me you've kind of cemented you can race against the best oh definitely so and then yeah. going that next year maybe that's the fairest way to be like okay you've made it and then I got a pro contract that next year yeah and so, did you say uh it was 2002 was your first year Three was first the year three. elite, yeah, of internationally, yeah. That would have been my first or second year in London, and I lived in London for like 10 years. And I'm going to speak to this because I had a lot of South African friends, Sappers, as we would call them, in yeah, uh, yeah. London. And, man, how hard was that for you? 15 to 1 was the pound was. I remember it was 15 or 16 to 1, the pound. Uh, oh yeah, or traveling overseas, Impossible. affording it. So uh, it's horrendous. It's worse now. Is but it? um, yeah, I think the pounds twenty two to. I can look it up. Like we've, yeah, yeah. it's not always going to be there, but it it is depreciating a little bit. But yeah, speaking to that, it it like I said, I um, Sven Martin and Uncle Martin were brilliant to me. You know, he's the famous photographer now, and um. He was a pro uh, skateboarder and we met and, and they took me in the first year. And then I was with teammates living at their houses. Like I couldn't afford to do it unless yeah. people helped me. So I had a lot of help, number one. And number two, yeah, uh, it's so difficult. Number one, coming from far away, but the exchange rate and then the experience of the course. But the exchange rate was, it was a killer. It is still a killer. Yeah. That's so crazy. it is tougher for a South African to get overseas and afford to get the experience you need. I think it's like, uh, you know, a lot of Aussies and sappers get put in the same boat, but it's so much easier for an Aussie. Like an Aussie can go and graft for six months on a laboring job and they can get their ride for the next year. You know, they yeah, can what are you it. making it? What's like a labor day rate in Aussie? Be like 500 a day no no 500 i don't that know and, uh, uh, it would be i mean if you I'll, have i might take that job at 500 a day right, if you have like, a little bit of skill, that like 400 us or something if you have a little bit of skill like if you're not just a standard laborer i, I don't know but it would be more than 300 and i would imagine it would be 400 i don't know i really don't know yeah it's it's physically not possible to have a labor job or a part-time job and get enough money like an Aussie or South Africa uh, or New Zealander potentially, yeah. you know, to work for six months and then carry a whole season. It's not happening. So yeah, you need a lot of help. You need it. You need to be able to sacrifice. Like no, I said, I, think I did, I did a few odd jobs uh, in between racing. It wasn't a lot, but it, you know, $300 or $500 goes a long way when you, when you're eating uh two minute noodles and, uh, you know, taking the water cup to the McDonald's fountain and putting Sprite in it. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't I have. I, I literally would not change it for the world. Those no, but you those you early years and hanging well. out with, but hanging out with the Aussies was also you know Nathan Rennie, Sam Hill, Bryn Atkinson, Jared Graves. Like these are icons of the sport. And, oh, totally. And I, 
I was basically take they took me under their wing, but we're all kind of learning at the same time. Minus Rennie, he'd had a bit more experience, although he doesn't always show it. But he's a smart dude, and uh, he helped us a lot. So obviously, uh, you're so I cut you off before, but you were saying, and then the second or third year, you got your first pro contract. So that's probably when you felt pro. Uh, how did that feel? That would have been amazing. Yeah, I still remember. I think I went to Fort William, which was at that time maybe the last World Cup of the year. It's like it's grim. I'm burnt out. I just want to get home. But I'd already met with EC in the Mongoose trailer, and and it sounded like there was something coming. And I got the email, and I I a hundred percent just scrolled straight down to the salary amount and the bonus amount, straight down because I was you know I'd heard about these contracts now. It probably wasn't as big as what I'd hoped for, deserved, or heard other riders were getting. Yeah. But you know, exchange that to South African Rand as yeah. a twenty-two-year-old or whatever it was. You were rich, and, and it was rich. Like yeah, it was rich in my mind, and and all the expenses and what comes with a pro ride. So uh, yeah, that was that was really cool going to that off-season, knowing that you know EC believed in me. This factory team was going to believe in in what I'd done. Um, but I, yeah, I had to pr- I had to prove myself for sure. You know, it came after beating Greg Minar at a Norbert. Yeah, uh, oh, totally. It came after qualifying first at another Norbert. It came after two top tens. You know, if it was a different nationality, factory, I would have had a ride earlier. But it's just nature of the beast. Yeah, no, totally. And once you did get that pro contract, did you feel like obviously joy and relief, but also more pressure. Now you're actually a salary pro rider. You, you've got to, you've got to get the results. Yeah, not in, not at the moment, but it's a very fair question because it does come. And that's something I understand all too well. And I've seen it with other riders and uh, not the first year. I think there was a lot of excitement, a lot of me still wanting to prove myself. Yep. Um, and, and we had some, we had some good success early on or good enough. Um, the second year was quite tough. We had some bike, well, we had bike problems the whole way through, but I only realized it second year. Yep. And then it's tough. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, a mechanic is working his ass off and the office people are, are maybe asking him why the results aren't there. And, and if, if he's not aware of what he says and how he says it, you can gauge that there's some question marks in the office. Yeah. Um, no, so totally. that can add to, because then, you know, if you don't perform, you're either out of a ride with them, but if you don't have good results, how are you going to get a ride somewhere else? Yeah. So it, it is. I remember it is tough. It was mongoose, it wasn't tough. it? Yeah. I remember. I remember the bike. Yeah. 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 It I can say it now. Like it wasn't great, great. <laughs> great company, different bike. The bike yeah. back then was a pile. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't going to be good. So. No, no, no. I remember it. Yeah, I that's did. something pe- people probably don't understand. Is in our sport which I agree with. Everyone's very good about being PC, not blaming the equipment. You know, in moto, that shit comes, it's quite interesting. They're quick to blame the bike and set up. And I'm like, geez, we'll stop chasing the setup part of me things. But anyway, I'm not a motocrosser, so um, it it is part of it. But you're not often allowed to speak about it in our sport, which is quite which is, tough. Well, you just have to look at the downhill right now. Like, um any privateer, what bike are they riding? Yeah. Like it's... Well, yeah, but you, like, mess a, you shouldn't mess a bike up these days. No, I know, but it's like, it is It is pretty... I mean, I don't do downhill, but it's it's kind of pretty clear to me that that commensal bike works pretty well. Like a lot of the... Yeah, yeah. The private, I mean, it's fine. cheap, it's good, and, you know, like it's it's strong and like uh it seems like all the privateers well at least last year were riding that bike yeah um, you can't argue against it um i think everyone's making good bikes and they might they've obviously gone on the race only type bike you know they may be yeah. not pushing it oem as much but the privateers grab it so yeah yeah anyway so let's go, we to, on. let's go on to let's go on to you your favorite memory of racing, your best result, just the best day of racing. Racing. I was going to say favorite memories those early years. 
but mm-hmm. I kind of alluded to it earlier. Great years, learning the trade, hanging with the Aussies, eating two-minute noodles, dirt jumping in between. Yeah, yeah. Best result, obviously winning is an incredible feeling. I didn't do as much as that as yeah. someone else. You know, I, I won some Crankworks, won a Norba, lucky. Anyway, I don't, I don't even like talking about it like that. I would say the one that was like really big and a big relief was my first World Cup podium. Yep. And the reason I say that was I was getting good results and that was the next result. You do yep. the top 10s, well, now you're aiming for top fives. You're to- aiming for the podium. And it took me longer than than I hoped. I had those bike issues where I got six and if I got to a rough track, man, I couldn't get in the top 20. So I was just kind of handcuffed. So that was tough. I probably, you know, wasted a year or two and I knew it, but I, you yeah. know, what can I do about it? Um, and then I would qualify well, get eighth, get a bit nervous, get seventh. Um, but the speed was there. And, you know, it's like, when is it coming? And the pressure was building and the team knew I could do it. And they were trying to not put pressure on me. And it, it, it was a whole big emotional roller coaster. So I think to get that monkey off my back, even though it probably took longer than I thought, was really special for me, thinking back. And to be a South African, to go overseas, not knowing I didn't, I wasn't dreaming about winning races. I just wanted to become a pro. Yeah, yeah. So, sure. and then you you move the goalpost as you go along. I think in any walk of life, you know, you're never quite satisfied. Um, so that Val de Sol, one of the gnarliest tracks out there, probably on Black paper snake, shouldn't have, mate. Yeah, on, shouldn't have suited me. Track. Yeah, shouldn't have probably suited me as much, but I had some success. And I think just for everyone out there, like I just never gave up. So yeah, no, that's totally why I'm willing to speak about it. Yeah, did I mean something that really interests me about downhill racing? And I've done a little bit of enduro. I did the EWS a couple of years ago, um, and uh, I just crashed all the time. Like it, like <laughs> I ride. I mean, I'm a pretty good rider. Definitely not pro, but I, I can ride a bike. And then when I get put on the clock, I just crash. I just can't, I don't know where that, it's such a fine limit. How, how do you even go to learn that limit? Like, you know, because we're talking about seconds, milliseconds, and you can just overcook things so easily. Well, have, I'll first get back to it because it'll answer the question. Have you thought why you crash? Now in hindsight, reflection back, or is it just keep happening and you don't know why? Oh, uh, no, I just, I just, I just get a bit too nervous. I just get too excited. I think yeah. like, I just don't think so much when I'm riding. Like I kind of like, I'm under the clock, I've got to win. And then I just crash. And it's like, I never, I, I basically never crash except well, when like, I'm racing. Yeah. Well, a couple of things. So you asked me what we do at, at a downhill level. Once you get to the pro ranks, you've got a lot of experience racing as a kid. Yep. It's a different kettle of fish don't get me wrong but a a downhill weekend you're building up so you're walking the track you're planning where to go then you're doing some sighting runs then you're working up to speed and and the way i attacked it i would break it up into sections and then i would say cool uh, i'm comfortable i know my lines i'm going to push in sector one and then i'm in practice gauging my speed am i making mistakes that i have a crash and then i'm by the time I get to the race, there should be minimal chance of crashing unless you're willing to go 100% in a section 110. But as you see, you know, even at the top level with where the sport is now, most of those guys, if the conditions are fair, say not raining, there's a lot less crashing than you think for what they're doing, right? Agreed, definitely. So that's that at a pro level is I can help someone build a race weekend so that their race run is some of the fastest riding they've ever done. Depending on the rider, I would often go faster in practice in sections than race. Other riders, Sam Hill, I think Sam Hill can turn it up even more. Aaron Gwynn on some of those race winning runs, you know, they're like, okay, well, I'm no breaking there and whatever happens, happens. But as you can hear, there's a plan, there's a thought behind it. So for someone that's new to racing, I would suggest before you get to the race, go to your local track with a stopwatch. It doesn't need to be accurate. But if you say, I'm dropping in five and I'm trying to get to wherever the section is as fast as I can or Strava, but make sure the trail's clear and 
let's yeah, not yeah. get into Strava people uh, yeah, being yeah. rude. Yeah. Um, so I think if you do practice reps of on the clock, you're going to get a little bit more comfortable when you get to, oh, it's a, it's an EWS or whatever the new, you know, EDR. Yeah. Oh, this is a big event. Well, it's just another timed run. Yeah, yeah, which is true. But then you, it's true, but you can't trick your brain. Your brain also knows it's not just a timed run. It's a EWS. Yeah. So you're going to feel different. But I think in practice, you've got to set your speed. So you've got to make the plan before you get in the, the start gate, when the emotions are high, that you can't make good decisions. Mm, true. So you've got to sort of memorize the course as best you can, plan how fast you're going to go and do that in practice, and then a race run will go from there. Does that make sense? Yeah, very good I mean, it's a, it's a long, you can get very deep into it. But I think realizing you are going to be uncomfortable because it's new. Your body is going to feel different, but mentally preparing for that before you get to the start line. Yeah, no, it's makes probably sense. What, what I would say. And then practice at home. Uh, this test event, the downhill just had a test event. Yeah. Those guys, some of them haven't raced for a few months. It's going to feel a little different. And that's why they were happy to do a test event. Then you heard some of them say, well, we're going to go and do another mock event. And I did the same. If I hadn't done enough off-season racing at local races, I would yep. go with my mechanic and we'd mock set up a race. Nice. Trainer at the top, you know, go to the top, sit there for a minute in the start gate, getting nervous, you know, those sort of things. So I think yep. you can practice and get more comfortable. Yeah, no, very good advice. Um, now, let's talk about retirement. And uh, you retired at 32, you said, quite early. Uh, any regrets from retiring? What was the thought process and how did it feel? I mean, 32 is early compared to Greg Menar or Steve P, yeah. but I don't think it's that early in the sport of downhill. It's quite a young man's sport. Yeah. Um, I think if you're the top of the sport, it's easier to go longer. So your race winning pace becomes top five pay sponsors are going to pay you. Top five becomes top 10. And then you throw a win in. For me, I was on the podium here and there and, and mostly in the top 10. I'm not tooting my own horn. That was the speed I expected of myself. So if I had an injury or I drifted out, eh, you know, it's, yeah. it's it's not, it wasn't going to be the best result. But uh, no, I've got no regrets now. I said to myself at the time, I would like to stay on a team where I've got teammates I like, bike I like. I didn't worry about the income and I just didn't find the ride. And I think internally, a lot of me was really was half in, half out. Yeah. So I always said whether I retire at 32 or 30 or 36 or 38, if we have this conversation now, six years after that retirement date, is it really going to matter? True. Is, is our conversation no. going to matter? Is, is much in life going to matter? No, totally. Whether, mate. I did, whether I did 12, 14, 15 years, I was, I was really grateful I did 14 years yeah. to answer your question. So not really any regrets. I suppose you're right. Um, thinking about the retirement age of 32, which is six years ago. Um, now, for me, just as an outsider, it does seem a little bit young, but at the time, definitely not. Only because we've got Aaron Gwynn and Greg Minar still, you know, still pushing and still at the pointy end. Um, but, mate, I'm super, super happy, no regrets. I mean, obviously, you can still bloody ride a bike. Seeing you out on the dark fest, far out. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I didn't quite think of it like that because when you do retire, you think, okay, I'm, I'm done. I'm not a downer anymore. I don't need to push myself. I didn't want to. I don't. People ask me, no, are you going to go to a local race? I want to support the racing, but I don't. I don't want to race. Yeah, and fair enough. It takes time. I think the first year, the hardest part is not having somebody to focus on. Uh, not training for something. And and for sure, you watch the racing the first year, the second year, even the third on the side. Yeah, yeah. You know, I could be there or yeah, yeah. You know, your ego comes up. Oh, but yeah. I used to beat that guy and he's still got a pro contract. Yeah. Should I should I still be there? Now, it's pure bliss on the side of the track. Yeah. There's only a little bit of going, mm, maybe in a perfect year if I trained. And then you think about all the negatives of of racing which you don't think a lot about when you're in it right you're just focusing on getting better so 
not a lot of regrets, but it is the hardest thing I've, I've done is is transitioning, if you will, for lack yeah. of a better term. For I'm sure. Not I'm not retired. I no, on, I mean, you're I retired. I golf profession. course every day with money in the bank enough to just retire. I've retired from professional racing and then learning the new path. Well, let's, um, you know, we've got fans from all over that or riders from all over the world. Let's give... I know what you're doing now. Let's give a little shout out to what you're doing at the moment in SA. Oh, I appreciate that. Well, I'm still lucky to be supported by some awesome brands um, post-racing. Scott being the main one uh, uh, internationally, which I go and do projects for, testing, bike launches. Um, and then all my partners now are, are happy with what I'm doing, which I just want to grow the sport. You know, from from Kenda Tires to ODI, to Crank Brothers, who supports my podcast. And then I also am supported uh, by Shimano, and we go on trips. We're planning a trip to Taiwan, which is to expose the mountain biking there. I've been on trips to Iran. I mean, these are all places I never thought I would go. So Amazing. that's what I'm up to. I'm working yeah. with these brands to do content, yeah. testing, uh, new bike launches, um, and which we'll get to later is the e-bikes. Is yeah, yeah. Hiding those, testing those promoting them uh, i did I, I really enjoyed the commentary i did for six years I, I joined the crankworks team after racing well they asked me if i was available and and that's been awesome i wish i could do more of that uh that's a little bit on pause um mate you're a natural at that honestly you're a natural thanks I know yeah I, I wish i wish other people would notice but uh oh, it's it, it is so, what it is at this I stage i don't understand it like i just uh, there's a I love downhill and I love watching it and I love, and the commentators really make it for me. And, uh, you know, with the change that's happening now, I'm going to really miss Rob Warner in the, yeah, in we the all comment. are. I mean, he's, he's for me, he's downhill. And, yeah, uh, hundred percent. And when I listened to you, you were at crank works a couple of years ago, two years ago, maybe was it? Um, yeah. and I listened to, cause I watch everything and I, and just the, the the ex pro and and the fact that you just you know that I don't know you just you really are, are a natural at it I think you should definitely keep on pursuing it. Very I appreciate enjoyable that. To watch. Yes, um, I enjoyed that, and it's it's actually kind of a pause of another career I really liked, and and I put a lot of effort into it. And I just want the best for the riders. I want the best for the broadcast, the events, and you can see crankworks or World Cups. And I've only got good things to say about Warner. I think. It would have been great if he was able to carry on, even if it was only for a few years, like transition. Yeah. And maybe he could go out on his terms. But life doesn't work like that. Um, I think his his guys are doing a good job uh, with him. Anyway, I mean, I'm I'm just going to leave that topic you just, know, there. just there. There's not much yeah. more to say about it, except I just want the sport to, to grow and, and the riders to be portrayed how they deserve to be portrayed. Yeah, um, totally. Um, Am I correct in thinking that you started a bike shop with your brother five or six years ago? Yeah, I left that one out because I'm still in two minds. No, I'm kidding. So, uh, yeah. I wanted I've, to plug that. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, so uh, where is it? What do you yeah, sell? Yeah, it's, it's, it's in Somerset West, which is sort of 30 minutes from Cape Town. There's, you know, the big CBD here in yep. the bottom, the southern tip of South Africa. And uh, yeah, we started it. We're doing our sixth birthday about, I don't know when this is going to air, but a week or so after we were recording this. Yep. And we also opened a second location with the support of Scott as an experience center where we're going to really focus on renting out e-bikes and giving that experience. Perfect. Perfect. And so you can come join us there on normal bikes as well, or e-bikes. There's some amazing trails at the second location. Um, so that's really cool and big learning curve, seeing the sport from another side. So from the industry side, the local bike shop, uh, my brother runs it full time and wow. manages the workshop and works in the workshop. Wow. So he wears all the hats, me and uh, another partner uh, support as much as we can slash probably piss him off because yeah. <laughs> we're not dealing with it every day, but he's doing incredibly well. And uh, yeah. We obviously seeing the increase in e-bike sales. Uh, we we educating the riders whether they want to ride a hundred mil 
or 120 mil bike or go into a trail bike or wear baggies. Like we don't discriminate, yep. but if yep. you're out there to have fun, you might as well put some baggies on if you're not there to win the Cape Epic. So I agree. Kind of, I kind agree. of doing that. Well, it looks like we're, we're segueing over to the e-bikes now. So let's start on the e-bikes, mate. Super interesting. Uh, the first, you know, all your career and, I love it, man. But you know, you're you're an old man now, 38. It's time for the e-bikes. Hundred <laughs> percent. No, man. Um, I I think it's a young man sport as well. E-bikes. No, it is anyway. for sure. Um, let's uh, let's talk about your first experience of an e-bike. Um, did you love it? Did you hate it? What did you think of it? Yeah, it was good. I mean, I loved it that I could get up the hills so easily. I think you know the first e-bikes back in the day were definitely quite heavy yeah quite tough to throw around yeah which is probably some of the topics we'll get to but uh i just i think what i liked about it it was another genre of riding and i'm lucky that i can ride every day if i wish or close to every day or i raced um it gets mundane to a certain level you know if you're riding the same trails every day or you train yep but e-biking to me was like a different genre. It's like going motocross. Oh, we're going to go ride motocross today. Oh, we're going to yeah, do yeah. jump today. No, yeah. we're going to go e-biking. So, totally. you know, it was really, really cool. It's something different and do it you came remember, at a really good time. Do you remember the first e-bike you tested? Which which one it was? Yeah, the, it was an e-bike Spark. So it was only a 120, 130 mil okay. bike. Yep, yep. And... uh I remember doing a video with it. it was cool. It was kind of how I use it. And I would cruise from my house to the bike shop. We snuck a little past the dirt jumps and then I would pop out the shop. Cause back then, yeah, you know, it was quite a bit to get the shop off the ground. Yeah. A lot of admin and, and, and it was kind of how I was using it. I'd sneak out over lunch or after the shop was closed. And if I only had an hour, I could do all my trails, which normally takes me two hours. Yeah. Hours. Yeah. Totally. So I, Totally. So I definitely used it from the beginning and, and and really enjoyed it. Nice. So this the next question is two pronged. If you were still racing downhill, how would you implement an e-bike into your training? And I know you're friends with a lot of uh pros, current pros. How much do you think they're using e-bikes for training, if at all? That's actually the one question I thought about sort of preparing or thought about before I came on the call. And the the short answer is 100% would use it and yeah. probably quite a lot. So especially the full e-bikes, the weight of them, I think um, it's two-pronged. You can use it to sort of simulate downhill and get a bit of a body workout. Yep. You can shuttle yourself if you don't have a, a, a truck driver here, say, in South Africa, right? Yep. And I know Greg Menard went up to visit him when we did a project, and the one – I think the one day he was on his normal bike. The other day he's like, cool, it's, I'm just going to take my e-bike. So oh, I nice. know he uses it. And then I think yep. you can also use it for recovery days. Yep, totally. So if your coach, if you've got like a big gym session in the morning, then I think I would, I think we would have actually put it in the program. Okay, go for an hour and a half on your e-bike to really, you know, get a good spin, but not to overexert your legs. And then you can still do skill acquisition on the way down. Yeah. No, it's perfect. Instead of yeah, going yeah. on your road bike for an hour and a half, you can you can really use it. So I think, yeah, I think they're really big help for, for the downers, and I would use it a hell of a lot. Nice. Perfect. Now let's get into your brand new Scott Lumen E-Ride, which is a 130, 130-29er. With a TQ yeah. motor with 50 newton meters yeah. and 360, 360 watt hour battery. You just got it. That's why we're talking. Basically, I saw you on Instagram and I was like, far out. I need to ask about it. I haven't ridden this motor. So just give me like a little mini review of the bike and how you're finding it. Uh, it's the future. I love oh, it. Nice, um, nice. I think that's something I'll chat to you about because you've got a lot of riders, but we can get into the, whether we call them half power or not, they're a little more than half power on specs, yep. but yep. to me, it's, it's kind of a hybrid for yep. weight wise, power, battery life, you know, without the rage extender. But your question yep. is, how do I find it? I love it. I love the fact that um, it still helps me up the hill. You know, it yep. still takes that sting off, 
But when I point it downhill, the weight, you know, between they've got a light one at sort of 15 and a half. You can set it up really light. I'm obviously going to set it up a little bit heavier. So maybe it's between 16 and 17 kilo, kilograms. Yep. To me, it it just handles like a normal bike. Totally, which yeah. Is the, which is probably the one thing I am missing from an e-bike. So if you're a person that's getting off the ground or throwing bikes around, trying to jump a bit, yeah, you could argue that a normal e-bike rides a little differently. I mean, factually, it does. It's a oh, cool sure. style of riding as well. Yeah, yeah. But it's different. Yeah. And this one, to me, it just closes the gap so much. So I love that it's so light. It just basically feels like a normal one. The power like transition is kind of seamless. So it almost doesn't feel like an e-bike, which you could say is a negative, but that's to me a very positive. It just feels that's, like a normal bike. So I haven't I haven't tested the TQ motor yet. So when you're putting down the power, do you have to like? I mean, it's hard to explain, but um, do you have to put a lot of watts in from your legs, like to get the motor to actually start going? So to make it feel more no, natural. No, I I wouldn't feel like that. No. No, no, I don't think you have to put a lot of watts in. You obviously do feel it, but it's it's more seamless than that, you know, that you get out of a Bosch with a boost on, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Even in the full mode. And, and sometimes you're like, is this thing working? But then you point it up a hill. Um, so it's obviously quiet. I, 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 and from what I can tell, I'm I'm new to it. I only got it, you know, a week or two ago and I've been busy yep. at Darkfest. So I've only given it a few rides uh, and I've loved every minute. But I think you can also set, how much it kicks in as far as I know, but I'm probably talking bollocks. But um, that to yeah, me... Yeah, no, you can. You can do all the tuning in the application. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, so do you have uh, the Scott Ransom? Is it the Ransom, the E-Ransom, the big boy? The one, the yeah. big... Have you yeah, got that busy, as well? Yeah, busy building up a new one of, of, of that. So that's... Okay. My full bike is the E Ransom, which is 170, 170, or 170, yep. 180, if you want to build it up. Yep. Uh, this bike as well, uh, you know, I might sneak a 140, 36 on it because, you know, you can do 140. Good call. Well, depending yeah, depending yeah. on what you want to do with the bike, right? Yep. Yeah, uh, totally. You don't want to uh, go over what, you know, the the spec is allowed. It's, but for sure, you can put 140 on it. So it's that's going to be pretty, really, really cool for me. Absolutely beautiful bike. Like I think it's probably the best looking e-bike on the market when you're talking about minimalistic. Yeah, like, it is so it, exactly. People you can't don't even, even tell it's an e-bike. Yeah, and, and you see the integrated shock helps with how clean the lines are. Oh, totally. Yeah, that reel I put up, people were loving it, and it's just a reel of a bike dude, standing doing nothing. It's a, it's a beautiful bike. Now, you know, from my research and from the people I talk to on the channel, about thirty or forty percent of uh, e-bike riders are new to the sport and a lot of is people it that high it is quite high yeah wow, it is really cool. high and uh yeah it's amazing i love it and um you know when we're talking about uh road bikes or mountain bikes typically we think of lighter is better so we've got the lighter e-bikes or the mid-power e-bikes which are 15 16 17 and then we've got the full power which are 23, 24, 25 kilos. Who do you think should be getting what and why? Because it's a oh, big, knew, big I, it's a big, 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 big question that everyone has. I knew you were gonna ask me, and I was hoping I was gonna be able to ask you first. <laughs> <laughs> How do you answer it? Because you're getting it every day. I will give my okay. I have thought about those are the two questions I thought about. How do you train with an e-bike or would it be a good training tool? And then which one is right for you? So how have you overall tackled answering the question? Because it comes even in my podcast. Well, first of all, I, I think you need to answer the question, who are you going to be riding with? I don't care how fit you are. If you're going to be riding with full power electric mountain bikes on mid-powered e-bikes, it's not going to be a good experience for the riding group or yourself. Mm. And generally now when we ride in Madrid, um, we'll specify in the group what we're riding. It'll be like, no, I'm going, because I've, I mean, I've got a few e-bikes, quite a few e-bikes. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's like, I'll be like, no, it's, it's SLs today, it's super lights today, or it's full power, and we're not mixing because it's just not fun for anyone. It just doesn't have the right dynamics. That's the first question, who are you going to be riding with? And secondly, 
what do you want to do on the bike? Like, are you someone that wants to go out and have fitness? Are you someone that is already reasonably fit like yourself? Um, you know, if you're looking for that experience, if you're looking for a natural riding experience, then I would say super light. But also you need to be very careful on who you're riding with, which is the main point. And then the yeah. full power, for me, the full power is I love the full power. I'm not a super fit guy. Um, I would love to go out and do 1,500 meters of, of climbing just so I can do 1,500 meters of downhilling. So I just want to get, I want to, uh, and a lot of people, especially in Australia, it's a bit weird in Australia that people have full powered e-bikes and they boast about how much battery they come back with from the ride. That's not me at all. I want my battery to be empty after, so I'm full power the whole time and I'll just go and blitz as many downhills as I want. Um, and yeah, the proof's in the pudding as well. I've got, I've got a uh, Keneva SL, which is the big boy, the big super light, and that's got about 500 Ks on it. And I've also got the Levo SL, the Levo Gen 3 Specialized. That's got about 4,000 Ks on it. So I just don't, I don't ride the super lights that much. Um, yeah, that's kind of where we've been at with it. I would, I would say that's brilliant advice. And that's kind of, as far as someone trying to buy a bike from the bike shop is where do you ride the most? Yep. What type of riding? And yeah, who do you ride with? And what are you trying to get out of your riding? Yep. If someone wants to enter on a normal bike, the Cape Epic, then yes, you're 100, even now 120 more. But if you're coming to me and say, well, I ride two, three times a week and I go up and I, and I enjoy the downhills. Okay, well, let's try to get you on a 120, 130 at least, right? It's safer. You're going to enjoy your riding. Yeah, and then what? What you said. So, I would I would say the exact same thing. Be careful because who are you going to ride with the most? Yeah, because there was this conversation at our new store. Oh, I I think I want to test your half your your half e bike, my Lumen. I said yep. that's great. You should go for it and test the full one. But who are you going to ride with? Yep. I know exactly. the guy. I'm like, Dude, you you're going to ride with full e bike guys. I think so. So I think that is like super key is who you're going to ride with most is brilliant and where you're going to ride and what do you want to get out of your riding? And and if someone says, oh, but the e-bikes are too heavy and they don't, I said, I don't want to be rude. How much are you off the ground and how hard are you pushing your bike? And if the, and if the answers are you're quite new to the sport, the weight's not going to matter that much. It almost helps with traction, as you know. It's better. They're more, they're more stable. Yeah. So worried about the full e-bike's weight at this stage, depending on who you are as a rider, I don't think is a, as important factor. I think what you've said is key, is be real honest with who you're going to ride with and what you want to get out of your riding. And then that will easily show you which bike to get. Totally. So you just said your, your well, maybe you are lending out bikes or renting. So do you have that experience at your bike shops? Can you go and test bikes? Yeah, definitely. Well, these these e-bikes are there to be tested and, and, and rented. And rented. And it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, that's for absolutely. me. Absolutely. That's absolute key. Uh, I'm not a online hater at all. Like, I mean, it's there. But I, I've just, I talk to people on a daily basis about buying e-bikes. And uh, I'm like, if you don't know how to change a tire, if you don't know how to possibly, I don't mean, not even bleed brakes or change your seat height or or tune your gears a little bit, you probably shouldn't be buying online. And also, you, you should go to your bike, your local bike shop. And a lot of the good bike shops are allowing you to test these e-bikes, and you're going to be able to see what really works for you. Like it's, um, you know, like a lot of the stuff in Madrid now, you can. Like COVID's over, everyone's got stock again, and uh, the best way to test to find out if you what bike you want is to go and test it because they are hugely different. Yeah, they 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 really are, and uh, yeah, I mean, I even uh, I'm lucky, I'm spoiled. I get bikes, I do stuff, and then I just say, just ride mine. If yeah. you don't have one to test, just go and ride mine because whether you buy. Um, a bike or not, I want you to at least have the education that you made the right decision at the time, right? Things are yep. evolving. 
Yeah, yeah, but, totally. Um, yeah, I mean, in South Africa, there's a lot of pushback against e-bikes. Like everyone is there? For, yeah, but uh, in terms of, I think is that as you spoke to the 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 exchange rate and things, are, they're not cheap. No, you you add a little bit of money to your bike purchase, so people are resistant because they and because they, they I think they know they're gonna love it. And they're like, yeah. no, no, I'm a purist. I'm a core rider. I train. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay, dude, whatever. Yeah. I think I think you'll ride your bike more times per week, so you're just delaying the inevitable. Yeah, the best totally. is they'll come in. Can we have this e-bike debate? I said, what? What's? I'm not sure it's a debate. What's? What's the question? Oh, you know, should I get an e-bike? I said, it's not a debate. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a it's yes. A- I know you're gonna ride. Instead of once or twice a week, you're probably going to make excuses and ride four or five times a week. Totally. When and I, if you, dude, if you're fit enough for a normal bike, that's great. But you know, sometimes you get a little bit older. You're, you know, you got more family stuff to do. Maybe you could switch over to the 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 lighter bike. Yeah. Right. Totally. So you're still riding with your other guys, and if you want to get a workout, just put the mode a little bit weaker. Yeah. You know. Totally. That's a good point. That's I mean, a that's very... a stigma, isn't it? That you don't get fit if you have an e bike. That's, no, that's, yeah, that's just that's, plain incorrect. I mean, lazy people are that's lazy like, people. Like, yeah, if you're yeah. going to be lazy, you're going to be lazy. You can stay unfit and you could still go to the gym for an hour a day. But that's that a, depends what you do in there. It was a very good point what you just said. Um, and one point that I didn't mention about the super light if you are a type of, if you're like 30, 35 and you, you love enduro riding, but you're finding that maybe you've got a baby and you know you, you can't get out as much and you can't keep up with your mates on enduro bikes anymore, get a super light. Because yeah. you close that gap. You can still ride with your mates and maybe they'll give you a little bit of stick. They definitely would in Australia. Um, but you know, like uh it's you can still do it. And uh the worst thing I hate to see is people on the wrong bike. Like you can just mm. tell you see them out on the trail and you're like, dude, who sold you that? That's not the right yeah, bike for you. But but that's on any type of bike, right? Yeah, Whether totally. it's an e-bike or whatever, the wrong travel. And that's, yeah, where are you going to ride the most? Yeah. Uh, you know, do you need do you need 170 mils of e-bike or do you just need 130 mils, 150, you know? And that's where you ride the most, you know, terrain-wise as well yeah. is, a, is a deciding factor as well. And it is a daunting task. As you say, you're speaking to all these guys, they're new – comes up on my podcast a lot when you do the listener questions is this conundrum of totally. what e-bike to get or should i go e-bike look it's an added expense it, it's, without a doubt yes it, it is you might need two bikes you might have mates that ride normal bikes and mates that ride e-bikes it is amazing how fast it's evolving though and especially the stigma towards e-bikes because i started the channel four years ago and I got myself a YT decoy, which was probably one of the first affordable e-bikes that were on the market, good ones. And uh, pretty much most of my friends disowned me. Like most of my enduro friends were like, nah, man, what are you, you know, whatever, I'm out of here. And within three years or four years now, every one of my friends have an e-bike. Like it's just changed. Like the stigma was so strong there four years ago. And now it's just, it's changing so rapidly. Is that where... just hu- human nature resistant to change kind of thing? Yep. And and something that I wanted to ask you about, because I think you are a bit of, you. I mean, obviously an ex-pro and it looks like you, you were a bit of a beast training and all that stuff back in the day. And, and what's your feeling? And you probably don't get it in South Africa that much. Um, but what's your feeling of young 23, 25-year-old uh, guys on e-bikes? You think they need to earn their turns? <laughs> uh, no, I don't care. Like, are, are you having a fun? Is there a yeah, smile yeah. on your face? Are you being respectful to the trails? Like, I don't, I don't mind. It's amazing. The no, other day, I'm not. I'm not that old and grumpy that I'm like these guys don't know. It. They've got it so good with these e bikes. No, I don't give a shit. Yeah, if you're having a good time. You're supporting the industry, your local bike shop, whatever it is. Totally. Go at it. The other day, what I will say is maybe an off topic. If you are new to biking and you go straight to an e bike, or just go get lessons, yeah, stop being egotistical about it. Go find a coach, go do some intro lessons, 
man, you're going to have crashes and you can avoid a lot of them. That's the one issue here with the e-bike getting straight into e-bikes or maybe the opposite of those 23-year-olds because they can bounce and they've got some good probably hand-eye coordination. What about the guy that's late to the sport, gets yeah. into the 45, sometimes 50? Awesome. Incredible. Don't forget to get lessons. You're going to crash, regardless of how good you are, good you think you are, how much you ride. Mountain biking is a dangerous sport, and I think you can avoid a lot of them with the proper education from the beginning. And, you know, uh, that's a very good point because you can get yourself into so much trouble. Like, you can get to, you can get up to yes. 1,500 meters, so, and you've got yeah. to go down. So with a yeah, exactly. bike, you're probably only going to get through a 400 and you're like, oh, I've got to go. I'll go home now. Um, so it's fair to say you're an e-bike fan. Um, how do you see the next five to 10 years evolving in the mountain bike industry? Do you think, I mean, I, do you think we're still going to be racing enduro electric mountain bikes, uh, enduro bikes? Do you think it is going to evolve into everything being e or how do you see it's it changing on the racing side no i would hope it's still normal bikes um mm -hmm. i don't think they're going to dis disappear sales and 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 things like that and the consumer i think that's gonna go way more over to e-bikes with with technology comes like exponential growth so that curve i think is just going up what we yeah. think is going to be there in five years might happen in three years i don't know and the writing's on the wall the motors are going to get smaller with as much power the batteries are going to get smaller the range extenders bikes are going to get lighter that's clearly where they're moving and yeah. and with that means maybe you buy one bike and you can have a battery in it or you could remove the battery and ride it as a normal bike on a shuttle day or an enduro race um yep. yeah yeah so i just new... think like the sky's the limit on this technology that we're gonna be able to implement into the sport of of mountain biking and e-bikes definitely and now if scott came to you and said needles mate we love your work. Clearly, they do. Um, we want you to design your signature e-bike. What motor? How much suspension? What geometry? Take it away. Um, I mean, I I have a sneaky feeling it's coming. I don't have to oh. design it. Oh, you I have it a sneaky first riders. <laughs> I, no, I just think, I I I think. The writing's on the wall and what the future looks for e-bikes. Yeah. But no, if you were to design I'd your mean, own e-bike today, how mm. much suspension would you have? Would you be 160, 170? What's the sweet spot for you? Yeah, uh, probably between the 150 and 160 if it's an all-round e-bike. You know, my yep. current genius is a 150, 160. Yep. Um, and I think we've hit a very good uh, sweet spot there with... Uh, with the way they've developed that Fox shock uh, for for the the genius. I love my Ransom as well. Yep. I think anything between 150 and 170 will be perfect, depending on the damping and the shock and that configuration. So maybe for me, I should actually retract that and say maybe the 170 could could be incredible for me because okay. then I'm basically going to shuttle it up to downhill tracks. Are you and, a, mullet, a mullet guy or a 29ers? Uh, I'm a. I do enjoy the mullet on my downhill bike and my ransom. Yep. But I have kept twenty niners on my e bikes. And okay. I don't think I was chatting to my brother about this, um, and we don't think we're getting the advantage of the mullet on the e bike as much as we do on our on normal bikes. So then we just stuck the twenty nine on her, and it's kind of, you know. You just kind of there's so much momentum. You just want to have better rollover. Yep. And it's a little bit heavier, so I'm not flipping it around as much as the turns as I am, say, a ransom. Yep. So. And I'd, I'd like to test it on a lighter bike. I think then you come more into the realm of maybe having a mullet. So maybe yep. it's a 160, 170, uh, light as humanly possible e-bike so, would probably so, be my ultimate bike. 
So would you be going the TQ motor or would you be going the Bosch? Like if it was your ideal sort of setup? Uh, it's all weight, weight for me. What's the, the smallest and the less? So for right now, if that's what's available, then it'll be TQ. Okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, sweet. sweet. Because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm bored and... And you're fit. I get I get bored of riding after two hours. Like if I just do like an epic two hour ride, that's actually good for me. I don't I don't want to sound rude. I'm spoiled. I get to ride all the time. Yeah. I'm not, but I have to be honest, I'm not a guy that needs to go out for seven hours. Yeah. No, for me it's not either. Me. It's two or three hours yeah. for me and I'm done. I'm not two or three hours. hours. Let let's yeah. have it. So then I only need the TQ and, and the small battery for now. So we uh we spoke about like some of the, well, 30 or 40% are new to the sport in general. They're all buying new e-bikes out of the shop. Um, what would you recommend? Now, it can be a product. It can be a service. Let's say like two to three to 400 euros or I don't know what that is in Rand, a lot. Um, so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, like two or 300 US euros, pound, you know, like just like something that's going to improve their riding experience. Once they bought a new e-bike. Yeah. Lessons. I agree. Unf unfortunately. Uh, and tires. And tires. I mean, I would have said, yeah, no, correct tires, good casings. If you're going full e-bike, put the DH casings on. Don't worry about flats. Yeah. Good grip. Yeah, definitely tires. But uh, I'd say lessons first. Yeah, spend it all on lessons. Yeah, hundred totally. percent. Spend it all on lessons. Totally. And, and off you go. Totally. Um, and now I've got a bit of a personal question or an idea that maybe you guys have thought out, or maybe you haven't. When I moved to London, when I was like twenty two, twenty three, um, I saved up twenty five thousand dollars and went to London and became a professional photographer. I started working for the big newspapers and I had myself, I backed myself with money. And I suffered come up, a couple of my best friends are sappers and they would do it so differently. They would, so they would invite their friends over. So uh, quite a few of my friends would have another South African friend that wanted to come to London. My friends would buy their ticket, put them up for a couple of months and sort them out until they got a job and then they'd pay them back but on the proviso that they had to do that to another one of their friends you know like give it back have you guys i mean there's quite a few famous you know you've got um greg Menard and sven and you have you guys ever thought about doing any type of sort of um uh foundation or anything like that for mountain bike for one mountain bike or something a little bit like what, what wind masters is doing because you know, without, I mean, you guys are the only two, like, that I know of, you and Greg Minar are the only two sappers that have made it. And I'm sure there's a lot of talent where you guys are. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of Aussies that have made it because it's easier. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a brilliant thought-provoking exercise. And I think that's, I haven't heard that that's how some of the sappers did. I think that's really, really cool. And and I'm all for doing that. So it's a, it's a great idea. Um, I paid forward with hopefully the education of the podcast, the yep. bike shop, no, totally, um, and a, and a charity that I back. But on the racing side, I haven't quite find where to do that. How do I do that? Uh, yeah. I'm available. I'm available if the kids want to chat. I'm available for advice, coaching, all that stuff. For sure. Um, and I think maybe that's something to throw past Greg's desk and say, well, once you retire, what's it going to look like? Yeah, uh, because I'm sure there's so much. We, can we work through the cycling federation and we fund it ourselves and with help from other people and say, well, we're, we're backing one or two athletes to world champs each year or, or something like that. It is, it is really a cool uh, idea is, is paying it forward. Like how do we help those next gen get over there? And we have got a lot of talent like Ike and Teo that ride dog fist, but they're going to the world cup series now. Uh, yeah. No, I just thought about getting, it because they're getting support. But what about the next guy that maybe can't afford it, but but has the support? 
Yeah. No, I just thought about it because it was uh, it was just such an eye opener for me um, living in London and seeing that. And you know, London is full of Aussies, South Africans, and Kiwis, and they're all struggling at the start, and then they make it. You know, it's like, uh, yeah. and everyone, it's like a little family. Like you, you have your little London family, and I just, I really enjoyed that that style and what I saw from the South Africans. Um, and mate. I'm done. Thank you so much. If you have any questions or, you know, like far away, I'm, I'm an open. No, uh, no, I, I appreciate it. So just maybe as we end off, how did you decide to start the site? Did you have a job and then you side hustled it or did you do what you do with photography and saved up enough for six months, a year to see if it worked? How did you decide to get into this realm of content? Very good question. Well, when I was, so when I was growing up, I was a BMX racer in Australia. And when I was seven, 16, 17, I was the third best in Australia, um, which if you know BMX, that's like pretty much the best in the world. BMX in Australia was at that time was like world level. Mm. And I suffered a massive crash and broke my hand like in many places. And I missed my window completely. And uh, I wanted to be pro. It was always my dream to be a pro BMXer. Never mountain biker. I wasn't really keen on mountain bikes. Um, and then I moved to London, became a photographer and forgot all about it. Didn't ride a bike from when I was like 18 to 32. Um, moved to Spain, met my Spanish wife. Uh, no, went was traveling in Croatia, met my Spanish wife moved to Spain and I read this book about how to fit in into a foreign country without speaking the language. And they said, Oh, you got to start a sport. And I was like, Oh, start racing BMX again. And, uh, and within a year I broke my hip and my shoulder and my, my foot. And uh, that didn't go down very well. And uh, then I started mountain bike riding and uh, did that for a bit. And I was always doing the photography, but I was so bored of the photography. And I rented a Merida E160 in Australia when I was there like four years ago. And I was like, this is an absolute game changer. This has opened my eyes up to the sport again. That it, it's made me, it made me feel 12 again. And I was like, this is so much fun. I need to explore this. And I bought an e-bike. And I decided that I would start a YouTube channel just for fun um, and to learn a bit about how to do videos because I was always a photographer and I wanted to learn how to do video. So I did that. And then a lot of my Aussie friends that normally give me a lot of shit about stuff, they were like, you're actually pretty good at that. And uh, so I started just getting the ball rolling and then I decided to go full, full in. I reinvested um i put i allowed myself a year to take off from photography my wife and i had some money in the bank and we went all in for a year and uh, i managed to get my first sponsor schwabi about one or two weeks before the end of that year and uh and then now i have uh, more sponsors and you know it's like it just i almost gave up almost like I was so close to giving up because it was so hard. I've worked for free for a whole year, you know, like not for free. I, I paid a lot of money to get all the bike parts and, you know, like very much, you know, kind of like a, a privateer. And then I got my ride and uh, I love it. Like it's uh yeah. Like an apprenticeship, the, the best and worst job in the world. So hard, but it's, um, I love it. So there you go. It's, Wicked. Uh, well, thanks for sharing that. There's a lot yeah. of nuggets there. I like, yeah, no, but I like how you also gave yourself a timeline because you don't want to go all into something for three, four years and unfortunately it might not work just because you love it. It might not be a business, right? But um, it's a lot of lessons there and I think it takes a lot of courage to do and it's it's epic. And I think that's a good way to end for me is I was also going to say, you know, e-bikes have kind of given me a second lease on on riding as well. Love riding, 
but I don't get to ride Dark Fest every day, thank goodness, because that gives <laughs> me a rush. I don't get to race. Um, but I still, you know, I like going down, I like going down hills. I like going getting a bit of adrenaline, but I need to get to the top of them. So no, I might no, as well totally. take the take the e-bike if I'm not feeling motivated, you know. So yeah, thanks for having me to all your listeners and riders. Mate, enjoy the ride out there. Don't worry what everyone says if you're on an e-bike and they're giving you a bunch of shit. If you've got a smile on your face, that's all that counts. Totally, totally agree. And Needles, mate, thank you so much. And riders, remember, everything we spoke about, the shop, his channel, his podcast, is all in the show notes. Give him a follow. You'll love the podcast. And we'll see you soon.